Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Marquette University Law School, Eckstein Hall. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. And today we are joined by the Archbishop for the Milwaukee Archdiocese, Jerome Lestecki. Won't you please give him a warm welcome to Marquette University Law School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a lot to talk about today. We will talk about uh, uh, the church and the archdiocese uh, um, uh, bankruptcy process. That's one of the things we will talk about today. Lots of serious issues. We'll talk about the synod, uh, last year's synod, sort of the, the, the mission and priorities of the archdiocese as we move into the, uh, in the next uh, couple of dozen years or so. Um, and we will also talk uh, uh, with the archbishop about uh, the new pope. But before we do that, I want to commend the Archbishop for being with us. And we're in a slightly different format today. You notice we're up here on the stage. He's playing with pain today. I'm, well, maybe not too much pain. Not, you're not you're much. in rehab right now, aren't I'm you? On, I'm on drugs, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> You've got what? You had knee surgery? 19 days ago, I had knee, uh, knee surgery. And uh, I, I'm um, really fine. I'll see the um, orthopedic surgeon on uh, Thursday and I fully expect that he'll say, okay, you can drive, and your range of motion is, my range of motion, uh, they look uh, to be at about uh, zero and 100. They're real happy with that. I'm, I was measured this morning, because I had therapy this morning, I'm at zero and 121. So, uh, so it looks like um, I'm, I'll be genuflecting again real soon. <laughs> I was going to say, is this a repetitive motion uh, for, for a priest? You know, a lot of, right, a lot that's of that right, going that's on. Right. That, no. that, that's, that's what made it so difficult. I couldn't, I couldn't do that any longer. So, you know. But uh, I'm not new to um, uh, the orthopedic uh, thing. I had a hip replacement at 45, okay. so, so that uh, 21 years ago, so um, that I had um, uh, the hip replacement. So I, I kind of know what it entails a little bit. So, uh, and, and the name of the surgeon who did the operation, his nickname is? It, well, he's, uh, they kind of referred to him as the god of orthopedics. You know, <laughs> he said uh, his name is Berger. Okay. He, he's the one who did uh, George Bush's knee. And um, so he is one, so he's uh, pretty good. But you know, uh, Mike, what, what this does to you immediately, and I can, I can tell you, anyone who's had um, any kind of, um, and it reminds you of the difficulty that people with uh, handicaps um, yeah. have in physical, any kind of physical difficulties. And then all of a sudden, everything you're normally just used to doing routinely, now everything, it, it, everything is slower, everything. And um, going through the, even this process again, I, I was thinking about uh, some of the great religious leaders I was involved in. And, and my early days when I was a uh, pre-student in Rome, it was the early days of JP2. And you watch this basically energetic individual. Then my, my second year there, he was shot. Um, and then you watched um, a continual decline um, of him, not immediately, but over a period of time. So that um, uh, towards the end of his life, he was really witnessing, literally in his suffering, kind of reaching out and ministering. He was, he was basically uh, witnessing the community. And the people you, that you saw immediately who were most in tune with him were those who um, were suffering from their own physical disabilities. The Pope, um, in his audience, he sits in a chair like we would have up here, and he always uh, wonderfully kind of demanded that anyone who was in a wheelchair or had any difficulties was basically brought before him, and of course he was already suffering from extreme Parkinson, uh, Parkinson. so he, he, he was just like reaching out trying to, um, uh, to offer a, um, his blessing uh, to them. And you could see how they basically connected with him. Jim Harvey uh, told me the one story, he said, when I mentioned that to him, he told me one story of an individual who was kind of coming uh, in the middle who was in a, in a chair and he was um, in kind of almost a spastic type type of fit where his, his arms and his um, neck were flaying and reaching out. And he came up from the Pope and the Pope kind of tried to basically reach out to, to give him a blessing. And the, this man in the wheelchair raised his hand and looked at the Pope and said, Coraggio il Papa, Coraggio, courage now at this time. So I, th I think the most difficult thing that uh, a leader has to do, and I, I watched it, Cardinal Bernadine in Chicago and now um, with Cardinal George um, uh, in Chicago, is one of the things that um, uh, is your faith is tested most when you have to die in public. You know, uh, 
And I've thought about that both uh, with Cardinal Bernadine and now with Cardinal George uh, doing that. And uh, it's a real testimony both to their faith, their belief, and then the strength uh, 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 to the people that they serve, you know, to be able to do that. But one of the things that, you know, going back, one of the things that this, uh, this has done is it reminded me immediately with people with disabilities and uh, how we have to be a little bit more sensitive and attentive to that than, than we normally are. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that a lot has happened uh, since you came aboard. You're in a five-year anniversary. Five, five years, yeah. right, right, five years. Five years. Thanks um, for inviting me back after yeah. five years, so I must have been really <laughs> interested. <laughs> You'll probably be glad it was <laughs> five years. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the, the new pope. You mentioned uh, John Paul II, but let's talk about uh, Pope Francis. Um, a lot of people thinking that he's something of a change agent. Uh, what is your, what, what has he meant to the, to the church, the larger church, and specifically the Archdiocese? I've got to be careful about what I say here, because this is a Jesuit institution, right. so you know, you've got to be really it is. careful. But no, I, I think what, what you have is you have a different personality. Every time you have um, you know, a, a change in leadership, you know, uh, the individual brings their own particular type of um, uh, talents uh, to, to basically the office, especially to the papacy, if you think in terms of it. In, uh, in JP2, you had um, you know, uh, just a, uh, an individual who was a, 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 a philosophical, creative thinker, uh, who um, kind of developed almost kind of a sense of um, Thomistic phenomenology. So, you know, those two things might sound strange and different for individuals who deal with philosophy, but he certainly had uh, those two. And then his impact on the 25, 26 years on the church, he, uh, as my predecessor, um, uh, Tim Dolan, said, you, you know, JP2, you know, uh, um, when they talked about traveling, he was like traveling on steroids. I mean, every time this was turning around, he was visiting one part of the, the, the world or, or another. So you had that kind of setup. In Benedict, you had really a, a world-class theologian. So, I mean, a world-class thinker, um, you know, in, in, in very the German style, the, as opposed to J.P. II, who thought in this phenomenological, when anybody who's, who reads J.P. II, you kind of have to parse it out, and you have to kind of see, he talks about one thing, and then all of a sudden, I thought he talked about this before, and it's, a, in phenomenology, it's like peeling, you know, um, an onion, you know, so it just, uh, you know, uh, with layers. Where in comes Benedict, and Benedict was Germanic, A, B, C, D, boom, you followed him. He was uh, tremendous in terms of his teaching style. He was a, when I was a, um, a, st a student in, uh, in theology, he was already a, a world-class theologian, so you had uh, that, uh, that aspect uh, to him. But now in Francis, you know, when you come to Francis, you know, basically you got a pastor, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to ask you to tell me about your pastors because I'm all of a sudden you tell me what would you tell me immediately? You'd tell me about their strengths and and probably their sense of dedication, but you'd also tell me about their idiosyncrasies. You know, uh, you know. Oh, he does this. Or, oh, he likes this. Oh, he does this. Um, and in Francis, I, I, I believe you have you have a pastor, and so what does that mean? That means he's going to speak out of turn. You know. <laughs> He's going to, if something addresses him, he's going to address it right back. He's going to be, you know, basically res responsive. He's not going to be bound by the con constrictions that, uh, that, that others are, and we can see that uh, is happening. So I talk about the two Francis effects. One is the immediate likability of Francis, and there is no, no doubt about that. I think, you know, the, his love for the poor, his ability to kind of put aside the trappings that uh, sometimes are part of the, uh, part of the office, um, uh, put aside the, the trappings. There, there's an immediate attraction that he has uh, with everyone. Uh, I consider myself a common man, so basically with the, the, common, the, the common people, there's an immediate kind of sense. He kind of does away with the, um, uh, uh, with the, uh, the office. Uh, and so that Francis, I, you know, without a doubt, we're going to ride that Francis uh, because that Francis is going to give voice to, um, uh, uh, to any of the issues that we basically want, want to address, especially those in terms of serving the poor. Now, you know, I, I say that the, the Francis effect because the question always is whether or not that Francis will translate into a deep devotion to the church because as a leader, that's the ultimate question. 
Someone asked me what I want on my tombstone, and that was already, and I said, gee, I've only been here like a year and a half, and someone asked me that question. Uh, bury me. And, you know, and, and without hesitancy, I, I, I said, you know, if you're going to put anything on my tombstone, I, I would want, he, he led them to holiness. So to, to, to lead, lead people into a deeper relationship and the love for Christ in this church. That's, that's basically, you know, um, uh, my mission, and that's it. So in terms of the Francis effect, the Francis effect is, will that Francis effect lead individuals into a deeper relationship with Christ and a deeper love for his church, a will, willingness to serve? You know, that basically is our hope. The other Francis effect is the fact that uh, the rest of us have to deal with, and the fact that I said he was a pastor, so he'll talk about things. He'll say things basically off the cuff. Well, you can imagine, it was an institution like the, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, which is worldwide, over a billion people. You know, he speaks, people are opening and saying, it's dogma. Well, it's not. He's talking about it, but they have to get used to the fact that they're going to have a person who is basically going to give you, a boom, his opinion. You know, if you ask for my opinion, I'm going to basically give it to you. If you've got reporters here, you know, I know if I say something which is just even fractionally off, it's going to be um, uh, maybe not the front page, but it might be the second or third page uh, of the paper. When I'll say, well, I didn't really mean that. I wanted you know, much more to be involved. So that's the, the, the second aspect. As we become comfortable with that, then we'll allow ourselves to be, be led much more um, uh, in terms of our, our level of comfort with him as, as basically a leader. So were you surprised when, when he said last year, and this got an awful lot of attention, the, the comment that he thought the, the church was obsessed with issues like abortion and gay marriage and contraception. It seemed to make a lot of news. What was your reaction when you saw him? I mean, he's, he's definitely playing the role of pastor that you oh, just sure, described. Sure, yeah. sure. Now, you know, for, did Francis say that it, w it was not, what was taught was not, you know, uh, correct about, a, no, of course he did not say that. But again, let's go back to being a pastor. I can tell you that some of the, some of the, the times that have kind of pulled me, you know, um, and uh, uh, ups, had me obsessed have been times with most of our well-meaning Catholics, well, devoted to, uh, to issues, but all of a sudden, when I'm looking at, at dealing with the, all the issues that are involved, and in, individuals kind of saying immediately, boom, you're not doing enough here. You're not doing enough with this. You're not doing, okay, you know, we'll try to do more. But you can see the frustration. And I, as a, as a leader, kind of said, well, that's what he's talking. He's not talking about the rightness of the issue, without a doubt. There is no doubt in my, my mind about the absolute rightness of the protection of life that should go on in our society. Uh, you know, abortion is a critical issue in our side. We've, we've allowed the mass destruction of over 50 million people since Roe v. Wade. So without, without a doubt, there is no, there's no doubt in my mind uh, about it. And uh, till I die, I will be uh, supportive of, uh, of those who are basically in the pro-life issue to bring that basically to, to attention. However, these are... These are my friends. Do, do they sometimes give me heartburn? Yes, they do. Because, they, you know, I'll hear, I've, and I've heard this one from the times I was a teacher in the, uh, in the seminary. Uh, if we only would hear abortion spoken from the pulpit, and I, I look at them and said, I, I've spoken about it at least a half a dozen times in the last year. I've sa said this. But... It's the passion that sometimes surrounds the issue that can create uh, uh, the, the, if you want, the obsession. So it's the passion that sometimes can create the obsession. And I think basically that's what France was talking about. Francis, being a pope and basically understanding the teaching of the church, no doubt about the rightness of what the church, uh, church teaches. However, we've got to understand that the issues that we have sometimes call us to basically embrace a broader perspective or at least to pull people in so that our presentation of the truth, our presentation of the doctrine could be heard. If I'm going to start in, a, in an adversarial relationship with you, you're, you're in opposition to me 
and whatever I say is not going to be heard. And we start off by kind of talking in terms of our mutuality, our, our faith, our trust in God, our ability to tune and bend to his will. It offers us an ability to take the doctrine and to be able to be heard. Do you worry that there is a potential rift developing within uh, church leadership because you have, like your predecessor in lacrosse, uh, Cardinal Burke, who's been pretty outspoken. He said, you know, frankly, I don't think we can talk enough about abortion. I don't sure. think we can talk enough about these issues. And, and there are some people who believe that the fact that he was um, demoted from an important Vatican court was maybe a signal that uh, his opinion was not welcome. Is there a divide within the church leadership on, on some of the issues of today? There's a discussion on approaches to, uh, and pastoral approaches to uh, in church leadership. I know uh, Raymond Burke. I was with him for three years as, as students together um, uh, in Rome. Um, um, as Mike said, I replaced him in lacrosse. I have a personal relationship with him. I, I, I know him. And let me tell you, whatever's painted in the press about Raymond Burke, one of the most pastoral and sensitive, outreaching people you will ever meet. Now, that's not the image that's pre presented by him in the press. Most pastoral um, uh, individuals. Is he passionate about certain things? Yes. Is he passionate about church teaching? Yes. I think with, with Raymond, Raymond understood immediately here in the United States, we lost the disconnect with the catechesis and the understanding of the church in our practice. And we did that over a period of time. And basically there is a, a real sense of trying to recapture the praxis along with the understanding. And Raymond has been devout in, in doing that. Um, I think you just take a look at Europe and you take a look at the devastation of Christianity in Europe. So much so that they could not even come to an historical analysis when they were doing the, 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 the Euro community. They couldn't come to an understanding that was founded in, Christian, in Christianity. They rejected that as part of a, basically a tenet. They said, no, we want to deal with that. Well, what, what happens when you're even afraid to talk of, about, about Christianity in your mix? You know, I, and I think Raymond rightfully kind of was caught the passion of, of, of being opposed to those who might downplay that, who might. Uh, there are others who wanted, you know, basically, and basically it's a style of leadership, who wanted much more, um, you know, a dialogical um, uh, aspect. Uh, so I think that's where you, you know, and you're going to characterize Raymond. I think you characterize him, you know, properly in that manner. Now, Given Francis, Francis is the Pope. Ray, Raymond is a, a loyal son of the church, devoted, de, devoted son of the church. So when you are talking about that, this is the Pope. And Raymond will do what the Pope asks him in any manner that the Pope will ask him to do it. You know, and I, uh, I say that because the Pope, as the leader, he's got a right to choose whoever he wants to work with. He, as the Pope, he has that right. If I, I came in as the Archbishop of, of Milwaukee. Uh, if I said, you know, I, I, can, I, I want to work with this person in this office or this person, this office, and want to remove or, or change, I don't think many people would have said, you know, you, you can't do that. You have a right to do that because you have kind of a vision that you want to establish and you want to go forward. So I think what you had is in, in the Pope, he wanted this vision to be articulated in the people he worked with. He's got a right to do that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the future of the Archdiocese. I mentioned that he uh, completed a synod uh, last year, and, uh, and uh, many people in this room obviously know what that is, but uh, you're helping define the mission as you go forward. You're helping determine priorities. Give us a sense briefly, yeah. if you would, Archbishop, of, of the priorities uh, that were decided upon as a result. The Synod is, is basically an assembly or a gathering. And um, early on, I, um, um, and it was basically in the, my third year um, that I said, you know, I kind of dropped it at an executive uh, meeting. Jerry Topshevsky remembers when I said this. And, you know, I think I'd, I'd like to do a Synod. Anyway, you want to do what? You know, we, uh, Synod. I, I think we want to do a Synod. We want to, what we want to do is gather basically people together to articulate a vision that we would have for the church for the next 10 to 15 years. 
And we need to do broad-based consultation uh, with that. So I said, well, okay, of course, you know, you, you, as a leader, you, you say it, and all of a sudden everybody's got, the next time you meet, they've got plans drawn up for it. And I go, no, it's not going to be that way. You know, uh, because part of the plans w would be, well, we'll do the Senate, and then you'll write a pastoral. I said, no, 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 we're reversing it. I'm writing a pastoral first, and then in the pastoral, we're going to call for direction to the Senate so that people, and why did I do that? Because uh, basically, those of you who are teachers, you know that uh, those of you who are farmers, the same way, you've got to till the soil. You know, you've got, you've got to break it up. Um, and so I wanted individuals to, to realize, on at least the pastoral level, an understanding of church that would be taking us forward. So and I wanted individuals to, to be able to be engaged in that discussion. So the pastoral was released, and over 15,000 individuals were engaged in an uh, assessment of the, uh, of the pastoral, talking about it thinking about what the pastoral meant, what it means to be church, how that church basically is articulated in our society. Uh, my sense always, um, one of the aspects is the, the church, you cannot understand the church unless you understand mystery. And I, mystery not as a, a dodge, but understanding it. mystery is a part of all of our lives. And so to understand the, the church and to articulate the church through the pastoral, one of the lenses that had to be present was mystery. And if you take a look at our society, one of the aspects in our society that we've lost is we've lost the sense of mystery. We've lost that sense of um, uh, the, the awe and the wonder, um, which leads us to basically God's presence. So I, I wanted to make sure that we would have, first of all, the pastoral. So once from the pastoral, then we started to, to glean the direction that people were being excited about, uh, about, uh, about the church and about the direction that the church should go. So we articulated then, and I announced that we would have a synod. Um, and then there were 1,500 um, consultations um, um, being done. Um, in every one of our districts, we had meetings. And I can tell you that one of the great things that, uh, that happened with the Synod is, you know, you meet with your priest, and it's called um, uh, the Presbyteral Council. So you meet with your, your priest, and I'm sure everybody here realizes that once the Archbishop says something, everybody said, oh, yes, they lockstep, and they all say, that's it. <laughs> whatever, Archbishop, whatever you want. They throw their arms around you, and they say, that's, that's great, you know. And if you believe that, I've got some land uh, that I'd like to share with you in the Sierra Desert, you know. So, uh, but I, I presented this, and of course, there were the skeptics, you know, about it. And then all of a sudden, the district meeting started to happen, where individuals were coming in from their parish. And the greatest testimony was done by one pastor who was a member of the, uh, the synod who said, at, um, um, at the, um, who was a member of the, uh, the council, who said at the council meeting, uh, Archbishop, I want to say something to you. He says, you know, I, I was really skeptical about the, about the Senate. But then he said, you know, we had the district meeting in preparation for it. And one of my parishioners got up and started to talk about what their faith meant to them. How it was important, how it shaped their lives, how it continues to, to empower them. And he said, I remembered why I was a pastor. I remembered why I was a priest. And it was their testimony that did, uh, that, did that. So, um, so then we had the, the day of the synod. I mean, you can do all the, and let me tell you something. You know, you, those of you involved in sociology or in group dynamics, you know you can involve and manipulate things in such a way that you can get people enthusiastic. And, you know, everybody here has been in, uh, to enough, you know, conventions and stuff where individuals get you all hyped up and you're ready to charge or do anything that, that basically they're, they're asking. So the, the synod was well done and well constructed. And that first day of the synod was incredible. People came in prepared. They read the white papers that we had established in each of the, of the subject. They were prepared. One thing I hate, I don't know about you, but I hate small groups, don't you? You know, when somebody says, now let's break up into small groups, they go, oh my gosh, you know, small groups. One of the most successful vehicles 
that, that we had at the Synod was small groups with people coming back said, mine was great. Another person said, couldn't be. <coughs> mine was the best that you couldn't. And why? People were prepared. They were engaged. They were sharing. They were meeting people who were in love with the church and who cared about the church and, and basically going forward. Well, that was the first day. So the, and there was, a, there was a trigger event that happened. You know, that usually um, they happen in, uh, in meetings. There was a trigger event that happened. We had electronic devices to be able to gauge the voting, because there was voting on each of the issues. And then the director, Randy Knoll um, of the Synod, who just did an outstanding job. Well, he read what a Synod is, and a Synod is a consultative process to the, to the Archbishop. So people were saying, well, are we going to get the results? And he said, no, the results are going to be given to the Archbishop. Someone came offhandedly and said that to me. So I came up to Randy and I said, no, Randy, release them now. As the people vote, release them now. Let them, let them know. So Randy got up and said, no, the Archbishop wants it's released. So we, we had the screen up and because of all the electronic thing, people voted. But it was key because it, one, transparency was established. And second, people saw the results of their own participation. Now that was the first day, and I say that that was a, um, that was a critical um, event. The second, I held my breath because how do, you, how do you have this just great surge of feeling and this great sense on the first day, how do you, do you, how do you have it on the second? It was even better on the second. On the second day, it ended with the Mass. And at the end of the Mass, after all of the, the telling of the votes came in, people, people were on fire going back to their parishes, thinking about um, what they were going to do, how the, basically the church was going to address certain issues, you know, basically going forward. It, it, there was a feeling of fulfillment that, that was there. So it was, it was a, a surge, basically a surge out. Then what happens after the Synod? I get all the material. I get a stack of material from everybody about that large on all of the issues. And my task then is to compile the directions that we go forward. So that was, that was basically my task. And so my first sense was, how do you keep the energy of the Senate alive? How do you do that? How do you hold me accountable? How do you hold my feet to the fire? <coughs> Many of the synods that have taken place in the United States, they're great. They're, they're, wonderful white, they're wonderful documents, and they're put up on a shelf. And somebody says 15 years later, you know, we ought to have a synod. Didn't we have one back in, and they pull it off the shelf, and they go, hey, there was some really good stuff here. That, that's the reality of the, of the dynamic. So I had to find a way that we would use a, a, a device to keep us on track and to keep the Synod going forward. And one of the things I asked immediately is that from the Synod, everyone, that one single person in the pew would be involved in, this, in the Synod priorities. And so how are you going to do that? Well, I, I, I met with a group, uh, LOLIC, which is a group of uh, young, uh, uh, young men and women, young adults, and they were saying, oh, you know, our lives are really busy. And I said, yep, I know that. So I know the pastor will get up and say, hey, once a month we're going to have a two-hour meeting on, on this issue. And, uh, and that might be nice for individuals who have the two hours. But if your father, or, you know, struggling with the job, is trying to be home for the kids, you know, how, how do you do that? So I, I looked at him and I said, you're right. But I'm going to tell you that I know that everyone here, everyone here, and there was a group of about 70. Everyone here has spent at least 15 minutes in the last week and a half playing solitary or free cell or a game on your computer. I know that. Raise your hand who's never done that in the last 15 minutes. No one could. So what we're going to try to do is basically take the technology that we have available, put it online, and challenge people, that individual person in the pew, you can't connect with your pastor who's got a, a little program or a plan, you can turn on the computer and you can, you can interface with us 
and you can be able to, to, to learn a little bit about what the church is talking about, about this priority, and basically go forward. Um, so it, it, it'll touch the individual. It'll touch, hopefully, every institution, and at schools, that's um, uh, hospital facilities. When I went around to, to meet with the uh, various groups, I met with one, one group, which was, interestingly enough, a, um, a senior citizen complex. And this one uh, lady we had raised her hand and said, Archbishop, I said, yeah, you've got a synod. I said, yes. How are you engaging me to be involved with the synod? How are you engaging me? Have you forgotten about us in, in extended care facilities that are part of the church? She was 93 years of age. So I said, God bless you, and we're not forgetting you. So there will be ways that we will reach, and it's going to be not only a parish-based aspect, but one that embraces all the institutions of the, uh, of the archdiocese. And basically, we're people of, of faith. So it's always generated by prayer. I, I, you, you can write me off on this if you want, just because I'm, I'm basically a priest, a, a bishop. So you can write me off on this, but I'm a believer. And I can tell you that the success of the synod that we experienced came out of prayer. And I can tell you that it's going to be prayer that's going to help motivate us to establish the priorities. And those priorities are, are vast. Social concerns, uh, uh, liturgy, uh, family, um, uh, dignity of life. Uh, they're, uh, they are all, in, and they're engaging every aspect uh, uh, that basically that, that we have. Let me uh, ask uh, you about schools. Um, I love it. Good. I'm well, no, I mean, I, it's uh, because we did a conference here at this law school not too long ago about the future of Catholic education. And uh, in many parts of the country, the future is not all that bright. I mean, you've got a lot of Catholic schools that are closing. Uh, it appears enrollment in Catholic schools in this area has stabilized a bit in recent years. Uh, the voucher program has certainly helped. How do you see the future of Catholic education playing out, in, and particularly in the city of Milwaukee? Yeah, well, let, let, let's start off with taking a look at education in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, um, Catholic education. Uh, Catholic education um, has, over the last um, uh, three, four years, uh, uh, has defied uh, the statistics nationally. It's increased. M members in... Um, um, and students um, in our schools have, have increased. Now that's, you know, that you'd say, well, why wouldn't it? Well, let me tell you, when there's been a 6% decrease across the nation for the last almost decade, uh, you take a look immediately and you say, well, that's, that's phenomenal. That's, uh, and it is. And I tell you, it starts right, right away with leadership. You know, and as Sue Nelson who was there, Sue, raise your hand. So Sue, Sue Nelson there. Who was there? Who was with the Catholic schools right away when I first came in, and then we were fortunate enough to secure the the greatest superintendent in the United States, which is Kathleen Sapelka. And you should realize that because she's a Marquette product, so she's uh, she was a um, uh, associate. Well, it takes leadership, and then it takes a vision, and to take a look at, immediately at what is the enemy of parochial school systems um, uh, throughout the United States. Two things. Uh, and maybe this is, uh, having been a, a pastor, I, I, I can share this with you. Shifting demographics, inspiring costs. No. Shifting demographics. You take a look at your parish and you establish a parish. Why? Because all these young people have come in and they've established themselves, um, and they've established themselves in a, a community. And they have children. They have children. And so you build a church, you build a school, and you look at it, and what happens? We get older, we get grayer, we lose our hair. You know, we, we, uh, we, we lose uh, that stuff, and demographics begin to shift. Costs continue to spiral. Uh, as I used to go around as a, as a bishop, as auxiliary bishop in Chicago, I would take a look at, um, I would take a look at the baptismal records. That's part of the, the, the job of, of, of a bishop. When you go into a, a parish, you kind of make sure that the, the, the records are being kept properly, the sacramental records. And I could take a look that 15, 20 years ago, you were talking about 35, 40, 50, 60 baptisms. 
All of a sudden, you're taking a look today, 16, 12. And not everybody was going to Catholic schools. So here you've got this, this aspect. How do you neutralize that effect? How do you neutralize that effect? Well, one of the, the aspects immediately that we're finding out and we're having success with is regionalization. Uh, that's, that, means that, that means radically that parishes have to collaborate with one another. Whoa! <laughs> I, I, you, you don't know how radical an idea that is. I could, get some, I could get some of my parishes more quickly to collaborate with the Lutheran parish down, uh, down the block than I could with the... the their, their Catholic parish partner that was three or four blocks, you know, uh, down, down that way. So, you know, there, and, and why? There was always a competitive nature. I'm from Catherine's. I'm from Luke's. You know, we're better than you are. You know, this, this, this type of thing, which is a... But now, because we're in a, the times that we are, we have to collaborate to marshal our resources to get uh, people working basically together for the betterment and to see that vision. One of our real successes uh, has been Kenosha, where 10 pastors, and I, nothing gets done in this archdiocese or any, archdi or any diocese without the work of the pastors and collaboration pastors. 10 pastors came together and they caught it. They caught the fact that they can't just make sure that Catholic education exists from this year to next year but they have to do something to make sure it's stabilized so it's there for the next 10 to 15 years. And they came together, and the pastors devoted their time and effort. And what they did is they created um, basically a school. And I remember going through those periods because we had to close um, three. We had five campuses. We had to close three of them and go down to two. And the two were already fairly strong schools. So they could have certainly stood back and said, we don't need you. We're going to be okay for the next three, four, five years. But we don't need you. They came to an understanding that we need each other to survive and to survive beyond you know, the, uh, the next year. So they all came together. And I remember the first thing they were saying to me, he said, you know, if we can get 300 students signed uh, to All Saints, our new school, we're, we'll make it. We'll be able to make it. And I said, well, great. He said, we think we might be able to do it. Then all of a sudden, I get a call, 350. Then I get a call, 400. Then it was like 412 or 414. And you know, when you merge schools together, you lose. It's, it's true in terms of population. When you merge parishes together, when you merge schools, you lose. Not one Catholic student was lost to Catholic education in the coming together. And today, there are more Catholic students in Kenosha than there have been in the last 15 years. You know, 15 years. And a collaboration that never existed before is now uh, existing. So that's the excitement, you know, about what's, what's happening. Now, when Mike asked me about, uh, about Milwaukee in particular, you know, the urban area and the, the urban set, how do you break the cycle of poverty? How do you break the cycle of poverty? Well, it's been known to, uh, to many in terms of uh, sociology and uh, psychology. It's been known to many in terms of university studies. Education is the way you break the cycle of poverty. But you have to, you have to provide an environment to be able to do so. So I've asked, and I announced this at the, um, um, at the school's dinner, our Catholic school's dinner, that I want to start a Catholic urban initiative for Catholic schools and to bring together individuals that will take a look at regionalizing Catholic education in our urban area to be able to address those issues, to be able to address the issues which uh, will allow students from those areas to be able to have um, uh, a pathway out of, uh, of the poverty they experience or the crime they experience. Uh, and we have to do so by creating an environment. And that initiative has brought a number of people forward who want to do that. There's a real love for this city. I don't know if you know that. There's a real love for this city. Um, but we can't just love the city. We, we have to try to do something to be able to heal the wounds of the city. And poverty and crime 
are two of the great wounds. Um, I've got a number of questions I'd still like to ask, so hopefully you'll bear with me for a couple of moments. We may have a shorter question and answer from the audience, but, uh, but I wanted to uh, get an update on, on the, uh, the bankruptcy proceedings, Chapter 11. Um, where are we in that, and where are we in terms of the legal status of the claims that have been made by uh, people in the clergy uh, sexual abuse uh, cases? Well, uh, right now, uh, everything is before uh, Judge Kelly, who's a bankruptcy judge. And there have been um, um, a, a move forward to address uh, issues, issues like um, um, insurance coverage. Um, there's been um, uh, an issue to uh, basically, which will be met later, to address um, uh, those who have legitimate claims and to basically to assess that. Um, um, and uh, basically to wait for um, uh, decisions that come from other courts, like the Seventh Circuit and uh, basically the Cemetery Trust. Uh, the interesting thing about um, uh, the Milwaukee bankruptcy is its complexity. Uh, it's not like other bankruptcies in, um, uh, uh, that have been experienced by diocese or archdiocese um, uh, in the country. And there are about uh, approximately 11 that have been involved. And the reasons are, uh, uh, would be the fact that there are, uh, this bankruptcy was not, was not generated by what was referred to as a look-back statute or lifting of statute of limitations. Uh, this was a bankruptcy that was declared by myself at my first year here, after my first year here in, um, uh, in Milwaukee. And I did so because I knew that we were dealing with limited resources and because we are dealing with limited resources, we need to do something to uh, address and bring some closure um, uh, to those um, who have legitimate claims um, uh, on the arch archdiocese, while at the same time taking a look and making sure we marshal the, the resources that basically push us forward to do the mission of the church, which is basically charity, education, um, and the spiritual worship of our, of our community. Uh, and so when we entered into many, even my own uh, uh, lawyer said, you know, uh, Archbishop, you should uh, let people know that it's going to be at least 18 to 24 months, you know, to, uh, uh, for this bankruptcy. And I, I looked at him and said, I'm not saying that. And they looked at me and said, well, that, that's normal, you know. And I said, it might be normal, but the issues that are going to be involved, that are going to be involving us here, are not your normal bankruptcy. So this is not your normal bankruptcy. The constitutional issues, the, um, uh, the r r religious um, aspects that are, are basically involved, the separation of, uh, of what really constitutes the, um, uh, the estate of the archdiocese, um, all, all those are separate questions. Um, for instance, you know, the, the fact that our parishes have been separately incorporated since like the eight, late 1800s, you know, that's not true for, for many of the, the dioceses in, in the country. The fact that there have been almost meticulous and, um, you know, just wonderfully kept records of separating and making sure that there was stewardship over the various separation, like the cemetery trust, like uh, basically some of the, the other entities that exist. This is not true for, for other dioceses in the, in the country. It's so true does that us. explain the... the Delay in resolving these, these sure, claims. Sure, be because what ha what happens now? I, you know, I'm presuming most here are not are, are not lawyers, right? So, when you enter into bankruptcy, the, the the person who declares bankruptcy pays both sides. So, you know, you you pay for the people to defend you. You pay for the people who are are challenging you on every issue. And so, what 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 that says to me immediately is, if you have a finite number, which is part of your estate. That starts to, to basically dwindle down and become nothing. And why? Because basically you're arguing not only against your, arguing not to preserve it, you're arguing against yourself on, on every one of those issues. And so what happens is immediately you kind of take a look to say, what is it that we can do to, uh, to try to bring some type of uh, resolution that allows us to, to be able to... Um, uh, to meet our responsibilities and obligations, and at the same time, um, uh, at the same time, bring the archdiocese out of um, uh, out of uh, bankruptcy. You know, it, it, an interesting question that was on, uh, 
was, was asked me on the, on the radio was the fact that, you know, they said, well, you know, we, you know the, the, the normal course is you come out of bankruptcy so you can be solvent, so you can continue on to do your work. There's no doubt in my mind we'll come out of bankruptcy in debt. So, you know, so when you, you kind of think about that, that should tell you about the complexities of, uh, of the issues itself. Right now, we're, um, uh, we're, we're at a point where, you know, the uh, issues are being brought before Judge Kelly. Judge Kelly is, uh, is kind of moving it along, giving basically both sides, you know, basically tasks, homework to do to make sure the presentations are there. And, um, and uh, at this point, you know, the best thing I could say is I'm hopeful. Do you, do you worry that uh, the longer this drags on, that in some respects people who, who were um, uh, victims of uh, clergy sexual abuse, that this, the pain continues, that it's not? I, I, you've talked a lot about healing, but are you right. worried that as this drags on, it contributes to this, this unresolved uh, pain that some of these people have? No, nothing we can say or do, no amount of money will ever, will ever heal the pain that uh, victims have uh, have experienced. That's ju just just a fact. It's not, um, but they're ours. They're our children. They're they're ours. They're our faithful. So we have to continue, no matter which way, to find ways to be able to um, uh, to try to assist, at least in dealing with it, or that healing, or or hearing it, and. There are other things besides uh, the bankruptcy that uh, basically would seek to do by pastors who uh, have reached out. Um, uh, what I established um, right away the first year um, basically I came here was what we call the Mass for Atonement. And what is that? Recognition of the fact of the, of the church. And, and when I say the church, I mean basically all of us. Wherever we were in, uh, in part of uh, the times of the victimization, you know, our, our sense that as a church, we take basically our responsibility for, uh, for that. And the only thing we can do is place it before God in terms of our, our prayers for healing and then for that basically openness. And when I, uh, when I say a, a, a Mass for Atonement, it's a recognizing that not necessarily just the, those who are perpetrators who were there, but those who maybe have remained silent, those who might have been ignorant at the time, understanding that wherever you were, there, that there is a, a wholeness about us that, that needs to be um, reestablished, and that wholeness can only do when, when we all basically accept you know, responsibility. Let, let me ask you a terribly blunt question, and I, I say this with all due respect. Um, uh, there are victim survivors who say, you know, at the end of the day, um, the archdiocese, which is saying that it doesn't have money, and you say you're going to be in debt after this, will have paid more money to attorneys to defend itself than it will have paid to victims of clergy sex abuse. What, what do you say to that? Well, first of all, you, you've, you've got to listen to that voice, and the, the voice is hurt. You know, that's, that, that's hurt, because as I said, no money is going to ever be able to do that. Although, we, we, you take a look at, and one thing that I learned about the Archdiocese of history, because you've got to realize I'm, I'm not native mm -hmm. here, so, um, um, and one thing I've learned uh, in the past five years is I've been part of what they call the Community Advisory Board, where we have people from the various aspects of the community come in to talk about. And one thing that I learned over the uh, period of time was really how attentive the um, uh, the archdiocese has been really to this issue. And what happens with this issue as soon as there's a perpetrator that's named, it's like nothing has ever been done. No outreach has ever been done. This is all basically new from, from this point. Um, it, that's the, the quirkiness of the, uh, uh, of the situation in terms of the, the whole community experiencing it. And as soon as a, the, uh, somebody is mentioned, maybe from the past, you know, as a past, the, the impression is that nothing has been done uh, in, in, the arch, in the archdiocese. Well, you, you take a look, it goes back, outreach to victims uh, have gone back into the 80s. Uh, Project Benjamin, uh, as a, I wasn't even here, I just had to, to educate myself and know Project Benjamin. Individuals even here at Marquette were tapped in terms of their expertise trying to deal with the situation, what they can do. Um, there, um, uh, 
Cardinal Dolan uh, uh, established a, uh, 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 an arbitration fund, which basically came in and individuals who had claims could, could uh, be done. Therapy has been offered over the years. Uh, when the Dallas Charter came in, the, we, you're talking about over 39 to 40,000 people who deal with children are, are educated, and there's no institution that can, can, that can take those same type of, of stats and, and present them, have been educated in terms of awareness of child sexual, uh, sexual abuse. So there, there are many things that, that, that I'm proud of that th this archdiocese has done that it really doesn't get necessarily credit for. I, I, along with every good priest, suffered the shame of, of what happened. Uh, uh, and because uh, um, uh, I do that, it is people that we serve that we basically have to, to continue to try to, to reach out uh, to. The lawyers, they, you know, and those are my brothers in the law, so, you know, they have to do their job, and they do their job representing, you know, basically the issues, um, hopefully with integrity and to the best that that they can. The complexities of again of this uh, of this bankruptcy is what generates the the rise in costs. I'd I'd like you would have preferred to take what we had as the estate and just turn it over and and basically look for a division. That, that doesn't happen in bankruptcy, though. Real briefly, Archbishop uh, Lestecki, uh, is the, are the lingering effects of, of these stories and these cases uh, um, having a major impact on the church today in terms of attendance, in terms of giving? Uh, what do you see? Well, it, it's going to sound strange when I say this to you, uh, but I've gone around and... Um, and maybe it's self-serving. Maybe, oh, it's Archbishop, so we have to tell him what he wants to hear type of thing. But people are pretty uh, uh, direct with me, and people that I, uh, that I pretty well know uh, have said morale has never been higher. So, so how do you figure that? I, I think you figure that because you take a look at something like the Synod. You take a look at uh, uh, people in terms of rediscovering basically their faith, you know, and... Yes, we we have to deal with the tragedy and continue to deal with uh, uh, with what uh, occurred in terms uh, uh, of the failure sometimes of the of the church, a failure sometimes of uh, on our part to be attentive, but at the same time to understand that we're basically moving forward and we're, we're called. And I think individuals, in my sense, have the sense of that, and that's why that seemingly d discrepancy exists. I'm going to ask one final question to wrap things up. We'll take a couple questions from the audience then, and, and we'll keep them brief. But my final question is on a completely different topic. Uh, you know, when you talk with people today, I think a lot of them are stunned by what they read, the images they see. You see extremism in the name of religion. Uh, we see what ISIS has done, uh, horrific images. Um, What's your, what's your take on what, what we're seeing in our world today as a man of faith? Yeah, as a, a man of faith, I'm, um, uh, as everyone is, shocked. As a person who served 23 years in the military, um, um, I did as a, a chaplain. Uh, I'm horrified by um, what well, trans, uh, transpired. War is, a, war is a, a terrible thing, but war usually um, exists between um, uh, countries. And it kind of defined for usually a defined purpose, and when you do have uh, uh, basically war, you're bound by uh, by strict codes of ethics that you have to follow. That's not to say that that every uh, nation or soldiers follow that, but there is a code of ethics that that you follow. What what we're seeing is we're we're seeing in the, in the name of religion atrocities, which. Uh, um, and as a, a moral theologian um, and an ethicist uh, myself, um, there's a, a, a term that they, they use that you don't have to talk in terms of the truth that's self-evident. What we see in the destruction of the innocents, uh, what we see in the beheading, what we have seen uh, uh, now in terms of uh, the burning of, in, uh, uh, of individuals, it's self-evident that this is nothing but evil. Evil. Simple evil. And what, I would, what I'm hoping also is that 
because Islam is involved, that the voices of the imams, the voices of the various um, Islamic communities, will come forward and condemn that evil. Islam is not necessarily condemned in and of itself by its religion, but I can tell you that if something happened in the Catholic Church that, that even came close to something like that, I would, be, I would be called for to condemn that and to say this is not part of who we are. Why? Because this is my faith and I'm a religious leader that comes forth and says this is not part of Catholicism. This is not part of Christianity. This has to be re rejected. And the reason I, I, I would hope that the Islamic community would do that is I don't want governments to do it. I don't want a government to come forth and say this is what Catholicism or Christianity is. This is what Islam is. I don't want a government to say that. You know, it's, it's the duty and the obligation of the, of the faith to be able to establish the parameters and also to establish what it is not. Many things can be done in the name of religion, in the name of religion, which are, which are false, which are atrocities. They have to be, they, in order for to be eradicated, they have to be pointed out, they have to be denied, and they have to be rejected. And so you've heard Pope Francis come out, and I, don't think you take a name like Francis and not be, quotes, in your heart, a peace-loving person. But when you hear Pope Francis come out and call for the defense of those who are being unjustly killed and, uh, and treated in this manner, uh, my predecessor, again, uh, Cardinal Dolan, because he occupies that seat in New York, people look to him immediately in, in terms of his leadership, has con condemned uh, uh, basically the, those acts of, uh, of violence. <coughs> Um, and, and basically you hear it from me, you know, uh, condemning it. Um, there is false religion, you know, and that's false religion, and it has to be treated as such. I'm going to take uh, two questions here. Uh, I'm going to ask the questions, be very brief, you know, speeches, please, and then I'll ask the Archbishop to be brief, maybe about a minute in, or so in his response. So let me do that, and we'll start right down here. And, and please, there's a little button there. If you can press down on the rim, the rim, See, not, not the little bulb, but the rim. Just hold your finger down on that and ask your question, please. What specifically are you going to um, do in order to fight poverty and break the cycle of poverty in the central city, in particular on the near south side of Milwaukee, um, where there is an increase in gang-related crimes? Yeah. What do I spe specifically do? You mentioned collaborate, yeah. collaborate with others, but specifically, specifically to take a look at the re regionalization in terms of the schools. You know, the presence of the, one of the, the wonderful things that Marquette did uh, here, I hope many of you were here for that, is when they did that presentation on basically the effects of, um, of schools, especially religious schools here in, um, in, uh, or in urban areas, and the effects of, uh, of parishes in urban areas make a difference for the community because there's an immediate connect connectedness that is not necessarily the immediate connectedness with charter schools or other schools that come in. There's a, uh, basically a sense, if you want grounded, uh, in the obligation that not only is to the success of basically the school, but the success of the human spirit that, it, that is there. So to, to examine, first of all, our schools. I think, secondly, to take a look at how our parishes are already responding to some of, uh, uh, some of those uh, situations. And uh, to take a look at ways that, that I can connect other parishes, suburban and other parishes the outside, with a sense of support for the, for the inner city. Yes. Let me take one more question and we have time for one more answer. Yes, sir. Thank you. Bishop, yeah. what sort of working relationship or influence does the archdiocese have over Catholic uh, universities like Marquette, if there were perceived to be any stray, any departure from Catholic teaching, for example, is it that the educational institution is so separate from uh, from any influence of the archdiocese? Uh, well, let me put it this way: the, the the influence that the archbishop has is a persuasive one, rather than um, you know a, a direct direct influence. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to have the one iota of an understanding of what it is to run a university. You know. 
I do have a sense to, uh, of what lines are crossed and when they no longer uh, represent Catholic identity. The only problem is, in uh, canonically speaking, a relationship to, to that, is that the, the archbishop or a bishop of a diocese, in relationship to any institution, has the nuclear option. Now, you know, you, you know, what, what is the nuclear option? You're no longer Catholic. Now, come on, this is, you know, one, it's a Jesuit institution, one, it's had, a, it's got a history. You know of uh, of tremendous involvement, you know. So, you know, am, am I going to press the button? No, you know, no. Am, am I going to try to be as persuasive as hell to to make sure I bring him in and to say why this is no longer you know representing basically the Catholic position? Yes. I think we're going to wrap things up right there. I'd like to uh, thank everybody in attendance uh, for their, their time, their interest, and their attention today. And most of all, we'd like to thank Archbishop Lestecki for his time. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.